Methemoglobinemia is a blood condition that can cause skin coloration changes, anxiety, and headaches, and can be caused by, among other things, excessive use of anesthetic throat sprays, drinking of contaminated well water, and even consumption of excessive amounts of processed foods. We'll talk about all this and more in this lesson. So methemoglobinemia, as mentioned before, is a blood condition or a hematological condition involving higher than normal levels of methemoglobin. So methemoglobin is a particular form of hemoglobin. We'll discuss what it is here in a moment. And what's important with regards to this is that it is a condition involving higher than normal levels of methemoglobin because when we look at healthy patients, methemoglobin is actually a normal component of blood at a very small percentage. And typically that percentage is perhaps up to 1% of normal hemoglobin and maybe up to 2% of normal hemoglobin. So we have a small amount of methemoglobin in our bloodstream, but if we are exposed to certain things like perhaps excessive processed foods, this percentage can increase and in some patients can lead to particular issues. So briefly, it's important to discuss the fact that methemoglobin is related to changes in the iron atom in hemoglobin. So we'll discuss this in more detail in the pathophysiology section, but briefly, methemoglobin occurs when Fe2+, or the ferrous ion, so that is one particular type of ion of iron, it occurs when Fe2+, is oxidized to Fe3+, form, which is the ferric ion. And the Fe3+, or ferric ion, has a reduced oxygen binding ability. So this is what methemoglobin is when those iron atoms become oxidized to Fe3 plus ion form or the ferric ion form. And I will be referring to Fe2 plus or ferrous ion as the reduced iron form. And I will be referring to Fe3 plus or the ferric ion as the oxidized iron form. So I'll be using these terms interchangeably throughout this lesson. And methemoglobinemia can also be either congenital. Some individuals are born with particular predilections for converting Fe2 plus into Fe3 plus ion, or it can be an acquired condition. And this is going to be the most common. So we'll discuss some of the congenital forms and some of the acquired causes of methemoglobinemia here. So in congenital cases, there's autosomal recessive conditions that can cause methemoglobinemia. And one of them has to do with a particular enzyme, an important enzyme called cytochrome E5 reductase. In the autosomal recessive form, there's a defect in this particular enzyme. We'll discuss the importance of this enzyme when we talk about the pathophysiology. There's also an autosomal dominant form, which involves hemoglobin itself. There's a change in an amino acid in hemoglobin leading to an altered structural change of the hemoglobin, which we call hemoglobin M. So this is hemoglobin M disease. So in autosomal dominant form, you only need one copy of an affected allele for the individual to manifest the condition, whereas in autosomal recessive forms, we need two copies of affected alleles in order to have or manifest this condition. So those are the congenital forms of methemoglobinemia, but there's also acquired methemoglobinemia. This is actually the most common form of this condition. So this can occur either through exposure to direct oxidizing agents, and some of these important ones include benzocaine and prilocaine. So benzocaine is going to be important here. This is an anesthetic that can be found in numerous throat sprays. So if some individuals get a sore throat, they can take sore throat sprays, and these sprays contain benzocaine. So there's going to be a limit on how many sprays you want to take with this particular throat spray because of this benzocaine. So if you take too much, benzocaine can act as an oxidizing agent and convert the reduced iron ion into the oxidized iron, leading to methemoglobinemia. So in fact, benzocaine exposure seems to be the most common cause of acquired methemoglobinemia and perhaps the most common cause of methemoglobinemia in general. Other causes of acquired methemoglobinemia include indirect oxidation. This is going to be through nitrate exposure. So in particular foods like processed foods, so we can get this in sausages, hot dogs. We can also get this in smoked foods as well. And we can also find this in contaminated water sources as well, especially private wells. So well water, if it has been checked, I mean, it's important to check your well water because it could be contaminated with nitrates. And this is especially important in young children because young children, if they're drinking a lot of this well water, they can increase their methemoglobin levels quite quickly. And another cause of acquired methemoglobinemia is metabolic activation through exposure to dapsone medication and aniline 
dyes. So dapsone is a medication we can use for certain types of leprosy, but also for dermatitis herpetiformis, which is a skin finding in celiac disease. So this is important to point out here as well. Now let's discuss the pathophysiology behind this condition. So we first have to talk about red blood cells. Red blood cells are essentially bags of hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is composed of four globin chains, which are four polypeptides that are formed into one hemoglobin molecule. And there are four iron atoms that are also in a hemoglobin molecule. And iron is important because it helps to hold on to oxygen for oxygen delivery. So what normally happens is that when oxygen is present, it can be held on to by one of those iron atoms. But in some cases, due to some oxidative process, one of those iron atoms can be oxidized into the ferric ion or the oxidized form of iron. The good thing though is that there is a particular enzyme, cytochrome B5 reductase, that can then reduce Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus by donating an electron. And this is the reason why we can see in oxidized form, we have three plus because there is more positive charge because one electron has been removed. So cytochrome B5 reductase is an important enzyme for helping to reduce that ferric ion that has been formed simply by normal processes, including carrying oxygen around. So again, there can be oxidative processes inside a hemoglobin that can lead to oxidation of Fe2 plus into Fe3 plus, and then we have cytochrome B5 reductase reducing Fe3 plus back to Fe2 plus. So as I mentioned before, one of the congenital forms of methemoglobinemia, the autosomal recessive form, has a defect of this particular enzyme. So this is the reason why we can have methemoglobinemia, because if this enzyme isn't working, then it's not going to reduce the oxidized iron back to the reduced form of iron. Now, the other congenital form is the autosomal dominant form, which is the hemoglobin M disease we mentioned before. So if there's a problem or an amino acid change in one of these globin chains, then this can lead to hemoglobin M. And hemoglobin M can be more prone to oxidizing the iron atom. So it can convert ferrous ion into ferric ion, Fe2 plus into Fe3 plus. So those are the congenital forms, but what about the acquired forms? So we talked about those direct oxidizing agents, some of those including benzocaine. So when we use excessive amounts of benzocaine, benzocaine can also lead to excessive oxidation of these iron atoms. So we can get more of this Fe3 plus being formed. Now in a healthy patient, they're going to have activity of cytochrome B5 reductase to deal with some of these oxidized iron. However, if we've got too much oxidizing agents floating around like benzocaine or prilocaine, then we can end up having oxidation of iron atoms quicker than they can be reduced by cytochrome B5 reductase. So this is the reason why we can get methemoglobinemia from excessive use of benzocaine, for instance. And some of those other compounds we talked about before, like nitrates, can also end up indirectly leading to these effects as well. Increased oxidation of iron atoms within hemoglobin. So you might be wondering, what's the problem with this? Why is this an issue? Well, the issue is that because hemoglobin is supposed to carry around oxygen, if hemoglobin has these particular ions, oxygen doesn't like them. It gets repelled by those particular ions and will attach only to Fe2+. So that's going to be a problem because hemoglobin is supposed to carry oxygen around. Now, another problem is that when we have these Fe3 plus ions that are not holding oxygen, they're just simply sitting there in the hemoglobin. If there are any remaining Fe2 plus ions in the hemoglobin and they're attached to oxygen, they're actually going to hold onto oxygen even tighter. So if we're to look at a hemoglobin dissociation curve, it's going to shift to the left, meaning that at lower oxygen levels, the hemoglobin is going to have more oxygen bound to it. So this can be a problem because hemoglobin is supposed to deliver oxygen to tissues. So all in all, this is ultimately going to lead to a functional anemia. So even though you might have enough hemoglobin floating around, because you have Fe3 plus or the oxidized iron, it's not holding oxygen. And in fact, it's leading to the reduced iron to hold on to oxygen tighter. So we get again, functional anemia. So tissues like the muscles and other parts of the body are not going to get oxygen like they need to. So this is going to lead to 
a variety of signs and symptoms. Anywhere from asymptomatic, especially if we're at low percentages of methemoglobin, to severe and life-threatening complications. We'll discuss this in more detail when we go through the signs and symptoms here in a moment. What's also important is that there's increased symptom severity with increased percentage of methemoglobin. So the higher the percentage of methemoglobin, different signs and symptoms will occur and those signs and symptoms will become more and more severe. So we'll discuss that also when we talk about the signs and symptoms. And then rate of increase of methemoglobin content is also important. So if we go from a small percentage, uh, say 1% of methemoglobin, and we rapidly go up to 20% methemoglobin, we can get more severe symptoms that way as well. And also, even in very small percentages of methemoglobin, so it could only be 5 to 10%, generally that doesn't cause signs and symptoms in a healthy patient. But if a patient has other health problems, say for instance, they do actually have anemia or they have some other cardiac or respiratory issue, then they can experience signs and symptoms quite severely, even at small levels. So this can be a very important condition to watch out for, especially in patients who have prior cardiopulmonary issues already. So as mentioned before, Generally, it's normal to have about one, perhaps two, and maybe up to 3% of hemoglobin being met hemoglobin. But if we go beyond that, we have the condition met hemoglobinemia. Now, again, healthy patients generally will not have signs and symptoms until they reach about 10% met hemoglobin. So there's going to be particular signs and symptoms from 10 to 20% met hemoglobin. These include more skin findings that we're going to see. So we can see cyanosis occurring, and this can account for blue baby syndrome. So in some cases, especially when young, they can be more prone to methemoglobinemia. So if they're, if they're exposed to one of those medications we talked about before or contaminated well water, then they can become blue. This can be a cause of blue baby syndrome. There can also be other skin discoloration findings as well, gray skin, very pale skin. And then we can also start to see if we were to actually check the blood, the blood starts to get darker in coloration. So it can become what is described as chocolate brown in coloration. Once we get past 20%, so from 20 to 30%, we're going to start to get other signs and symptoms. So these include anxiety, headaches, and lightheadedness. So again, between 20 to 30% met hemoglobin, we'll get some of these other findings. And then from 30% to 50% met hemoglobin, we can start to get dyspnea or shortness of breath. Patients can have tachypnea, a uh, respiratory rate greater than 20 breaths per minute. They can also experience weakness, and they can start to have some confusion. So altered mental status can start to occur as well, and, and this group of patients can also start to have chest pain. And from 50% met hemoglobin to 70%, this is going to cause more neurological and cardiac issues, including seizures, arrhythmias, and very high acidosis levels. Um, there can also be delirium and coma as well occurring. And then anything beyond 70% is often going to be fatal. So those are some of the signs and symptoms that occur with increasing severity or increasing percentage of methemoglobin. So how do clinicians diagnose methemoglobinemia? And so it's going to be important to do blood work. So CBC, complete blood count, checking LDH or lactate dehydrogenase, indirect bilirubin, haptoglobin. So you're looking for, in some cases, hemolysis. Serum nitrites can also be important, especially if you're considering that they have a nitrate exposure. Hemoglobin electrophoresis, looking for hemoglobin M can be important if you are suspecting that this is an autosomal dominant congenital form of methemoglobinemia. Another interesting test that you can do even at the bedside for the patient is examination of blood color. So anywhere from perhaps about 15% methemoglobin content can lead to that blood coloration change we talked about before, that dark chocolate brown coloration of blood. So the way to do this is to take some blood from the patient and then have it exposed to room temperature or even aerated with oxygen. And if it remains that dark brown coloration, then that can be a sign, especially if you have clinical suspicion of methemoglobinemia, that blood coloration can be a sign or give you more evidence that this is methemoglobinemia. Doing an ABG or arterial blood gas can be important. We'll talk about that here in a moment. Pulse ox imagery is often going to be used, but as we will see, it's not that helpful. What's going to be most helpful is what we call co-oximetry and multi-wavelength co-oximetry is going to be what's important. So co-oximetry can be used to look out for methemoglobin, can also be used for looking for carboxyhemoglobin. So it's helpful in distinguishing between different types of hemoglobin. And some particular clinical clues that might help you if you suspect methemoglobinemia include SpO2, which would be found on pulse oximetry. If that won't increase beyond 85%, even when the patient is 
taking high O2 supplementation. So that can be important finding. Another is discrepancy between SpO2 and SaO2, or the arterial saturation of O2, which is found on arterial blood gas. So if you see a discrepancy between SpO2 and SaO2, so for instance, SpO2 is low, perhaps it's around 85%, and that's often what's found is that no matter how much oxygen you give the patient, it won't budge past 85%. If you see 85% on SpO2, but then you see a higher number on SaO2, perhaps 95 to 99%, then that can be also another sign that this is met hemoglobinemia. We can also see that dyspnea can be refractory to supplemental oxygen in met hemoglobinemia. So dyspnea is shortness of breath. So if they have shortness of breath, you're giving them oxygen, but it's not helping. That can be another sign. And that dark chocolate brown colored blood can also be another clinical finding as well. Once a clinician has made the diagnosis, how is it treated? So it's important to identify and stop the offending agent. Again, majority of the time, this is going to be acquired methemoglobinemia and pr probably the most common cause of acquired methemoglobinemia is benzocaine or excessive use of benzocaine in those throat sprays. So you want to identify and stop that offending agent. It could be dapsone. We talked about that before. You also want to administer high flow oxygen. And what's going to be the hallmark treatment of methemoglobinemia is methylene blue. So you can remember met hemoglobinemia is treated with methylene blue because you can think of that met at the beginning of methylene blue. And you can also think that cyanosis can be one of the first findings of met hemoglobinemia. So it's blue. So you can remember methylene blue can treat blue coloration in met hemoglobinemia. So that's a way to remember that methylene blue is a treatment. But there's a few caveats here. You want to avoid methylene blue in those with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. You also want to be careful in using it in patients who are on SSRIs, for instance, because it can trigger serotonin syndrome. So it acts as a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And you also want to check and make sure the patient isn't pregnant because methylene blue can also be a teratogen. So it can be very harmful to a developing fetus. So you don't want to use methylene blue in any of those particular cases. What do you use as an alternative? Well, the alternative is actually vitamin C or ascorbic acid at high dose in IV form. The reason is because vitamin C reduces that Fe3 plus back to Fe2 plus. So this is the reason why vitamin C is important in absorption of iron as well. So that is going to be a treatment if we can't use methylene blue. Exchange transfusion is also a possible treatment as well, and hyperbaric oxygen therapy can also be a treatment. Please check out my other lessons on other blood conditions like iron deficiency anemia if you want more information on those topics. Please consider joining as a member for members-only content. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching, and hope to see you next time.